Hello, and thanks for joining us for the Conversations World Oceans Day webinar. I'm Jack Marley, I'm Environment and Energy Editor at The Conversation. Since the Industrial Revolution, the ocean has absorbed between 30 and 40% of all the CO2 that humans have added to the atmosphere. As the planet has warmed, 93% of that excess heat has been mopped up by the ocean. In many cases, the ocean is the front line of our rapidly changing world. If greenhouse gas emissions continue unabated, scientists predict that we could see the near total collapse of tropical coral reefs this century, which are among the most species rich ecosystems on Earth. All that additional warming would limit how much oxygen the ocean can hold too, potentially helping to create vast areas where life can no longer flourish. Already the oceans are more acidic today than at any other time in human history, thanks in large part to the way our emissions have interfered with the ocean's delicate chemistry. While the world considers how to restart life following the pandemic in a way that brings our societies and economies into greater harmony with nature, it's the ocean that holds many of the greatest challenges, but also many of the solutions. This year marks the beginning of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. One intention of this international landmark is to highlight the window of opportunity that exists from now until 2030 to fundamentally change how we relate to the ocean. To meet this opportunity, it's essential that we understand how humanity arrived at this perilous crossroads. Only then can we see the opportunities that exist for us to plot a new course for life on this blue planet. Joining me to discuss the ocean's history and its potential future are three experts. Jean-Baptiste Jufre is a postdoctoral researcher in sustainability science at the Stockholm Resilience Center at Stockholm University. His research explores what the Anthropocene means for the ocean and how social, economic, and ecological challenges to sustainability can be overcome. <clears throat> Jessica Whiteside is an associate professor in ocean and earth science at the University of Southampton. She studies the many chapters of our blue planet's history, particularly how life has evolved through mass extinction events. And Joanne Preston is a reader in marine ecology and evolution at the University of Portsmouth. And she's also co-founder of the Native Oyster Network, which is a community of academics and conservationists dedicated to restoring self-sustaining populations of native oysters in Europe. If you have any questions uh, for our panel, then please put them in the comment stream and we'll try to get to them at the end. Um, welcome to all of our panelists and thank you very much for being here today. Um, for my very first question, I'd like to start with, with you, Jessica. Um, how old is the ocean and why has it always been so important to life on Earth? Hey, thanks for that question, Jack. Our ocean is very old. In fact, it's 4.3 billion years old, almost as old as the Earth itself. And it's our most precious resource. It's what makes our planet unique. Other than ancient Mars, which had an acidic ocean and the icy moons that circled the gas giants in our outer solar system, this is the only water we know of in the universe. In fact, the search for the possibility of life elsewhere, the very definition of the habitable zone focuses first and foremost on the presence of water. That's where the search for life begins. The NASA mantra is even follow the water. Water is the universal solvent, the central ingredient, and that's because it's ideal for allowing material in and out of cells. So that's nutrients into the cell and waste materials out of a cell. So very much the understanding of how our oceans have sustained over such a long time, 4.3 billion years, is intricately connected to the story of eventual life on our planet. The oceans hold that golden thread that weaves everything together. So let's talk a little bit about origins. The solar system settled into its current layout 4.5 billion years ago. The Earth formed from gravity pulling swirling gas and, gas and dust in and then resulting in us being the third planet from the sun. There was no liquid water on the very earliest Earth because it was far too hot within that infant stage. In fact, this interval of time has been called the Hadean. That's its proper name after Hades, the Greek god of the underworld. And it used to be thought, and in fact, even when I was a student in the textbooks, it was described as hot, hellish, a time when the planet was bombarded by meteorites and comets. It was lifeless and it certainly was not wet. But it turns out that early in Earth's history, it did cool 
low um, to temperatures below the boiling point of water that allows it to actually sustain an ocean and an ocean to form. So at its infant 150 million years old stage, the oceans formed. And the oceans formed from off-gassing a water vapor. So that's the gas phase of water that cools, condenses, and rains out as liquid water from the Earth's molten interior. So like we see today with volcanic activity, basically steam escaped out of Earth's rocks and it was possibly aided by the delivery of icy comets or meteors that were smashing into the Earth. So the oceans were really early on in our Earth's history and how Earth retained that liquid water for almost its entire history and did so within an average temperature within a very narrow window, a narrow window being equivalent to the temperatures between your freezer and your stovetop. This is all fascinating. The oceans have sustained themselves for 4.3 billion years, and they did it in the face of a very faint young sun early on. In the very beginning, our sun was only 70% as bright as it is now. This is a great topic of interest because the ocean retained its habitability and the way it did it has to do with the atmospheric composition of greenhouse gases, particularly CO2 and methane, changing dramatically at that time and throughout Earth's history. Now we dread that mention of CO2 as a greenhouse in today's world because it's rapid increase is a bad thing, but the presence early on 4.3 billion years ago was a good thing. Otherwise it would have been a much colder world and the oceans wouldn't have formed and life wouldn't have persisted. Now let's talk just a little bit about oceans and the importance for life over this 4.3 billion year history. Life emerges at 3.5 billion years. Um, on our planet, and the ocean was the venue for that origins of life. It turns out that the oceans are the venue for all, nearly all the key evolutionary innovations on our planet. So the evolutionary storms that alter biogeochemical cycling, they happen in the oceans, all of them besides the spread of land pants, plants, although that actually originates from coming from the ocean onto land. So that's the origin of life itself, the big divide between bacteria and nucleated organisms, eukaryotes, and the first whiffs of oxygen that then sustain oxygen in the atmosphere and build up for the proliferation of complex life, the rise of multicellular life, even mobility. Early on, bacteria and multicellular life didn't even move for burrowing, for churning below the ground to cycle nutrients like carbon and nitrogen the rise of animals and the rise of carnivory, all of these critical events are related to the coevolution of climate, the coevolution of life, and the coevolution of oceans. Brilliant, thank you, Jessica. Um, I guess that I'm keen now to sort of find out when humans came into this story. And um, uh, we know, for instance, that the earliest evidence of, of people actually sort of using the sea for sustenance are some remains of shellfish that, shellfish that were found in 164,000 year old cave deposits. So Joanne, could, could you tell us a bit more about how that particular relationship evolved, our relationship with harvesting food from the ocean? Yeah, sure. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about oysters. Um, you know, and as humans, we love to fish and consume oysters. You know, they're fantastic, easily accessible source of really high quality protein. And we've been doing large scale cultivation of the um, of oysters since the Roman Empire, but we have been eating them since the dawn of humanity. Now, where I'm sitting now in Europe, we used to have um, the native oysters, Ostra edulis, going from Morocco along the coast of Europe all the way up to Norway throughout the Mediterranean. But here, herein lays a problem. When you've got a species that is easily accessible, um, it's really easy to take from the sea. And the thing about the oysters is they don't move. They what we call sessile. Um, when they're adult, they just stay on the seabed. And so they can't run away, they can't shift their range. But what is important when they um as when they're larvae, when they're very small baby phases of this species, the larvae swim in the in the ocean and uh, they need adult oysters to settle on. We call them gregarious. Um, so you need the oysters on the seabed to complete the life cycle. And this is how they create these amazingly diverse biogenic um, oyster reefs. Now, it was the Industrial Revolution and the mechanization of fishing that enabled powered vessels to go offshore for periods of time and um, catch much larger, much larger numbers of oysters. 
And this is the thing that enabled unsustainable landings and a very, very rapid overexploitation during the mid 1800s. So the habitat we see today is nothing like the one we would have seen if we had been walking along shores in the 1700s and early 1800s. And here are some examples. So um, there's a 120,000 strong fleet of oyster dredges that in 1864 supplied 700 million oysters to London alone in that year. In the Bay of Biscay, 80 million oysters were harvested annually um, prior to 1859. And in France, we have historical piles of shells of the native oyster that contain five trillion shells. So massive over-exploitation in the mid 1800s has meant that there's been this catastrophic decline. And now we've lost over 95% of all oyster reefs across Europe. Um, and many areas are completely extinct. Now, the problem is we've also lost our living memory uh, about what this healthy, thriving oyster reef habitat looks like. And what's disastrous for us and biodiversity and the climate is we've lost the services they provide. So oysters filter water and they draw down nutrients, they control pollution, but they also create an essential, complex, um, three-dimensional structure that um, provides habitat for lots of other species. They support biodiversity and they provide a nursery ground for fish. And we've lost all those benefits that they provide as well as the habitat. Thanks, Joanne. So I guess that that's a really kind of good illustrative example of just how one fishery has really taught, transformed the sea that we would kind of have, uh, have once been accustomed to, to, to what we see today. Um, but it, obviously it's clear that humans have been influencing sea life for a very long time. Um, but I guess that uh, there's there's nothing that really compares to sort of what we've seen in, in even just our lifetime, sort of in recent decades. And I know that you, uh, Jean-Baptiste, um, you discovered something exceptional um, about our relationship with the ocean in just uh, in recent history. And uh, I'm just keen for you to sort of tell us a little bit more about that. Well, you said it, Jack. Uh, I mean, and we've just heard Joan talking about that, like humanity has depended on the ocean for millennia. But there is something different today. Um, driven in part by technological innovation, the extent and the diversity of today's ocean use is unprecedented. And you have all these hopes and expectation for the ocean to be the next economic frontier and to be the engine of future human development. And this is really recent. Like, Post-World War II, uh, from the 1950s, the, the period is often described as the Great Acceleration. Because you, you, you actually, if you look at a range of socio-economic and environmental variables, from global world population, to the GDP, to deforestation, water consumption, and so on, you see exponential increase over the board, across all the variables. And that's been called the Great Acceleration, and that's been an iconic illustration of, of the Anthropocene, which is the, the age of humans, right? When humans have become a dominant force of, of planetary change. Well, the same is happening in the ocean. Many ocean-based industries today are growing faster than the global economy, and in many cases, exponentially. This is what we called the Blue Acceleration in the spirit of the Great Acceleration, really describing a new phase in humanity's relationship with the ocean that exhibits a phenomenal rate of change over the last 30 years. So it's not 50 years, it's not 70 years, it's really, you see the sharp acceleration characterizing the onset of the 21st century, so it's more recent. Just to give you a few examples, over the past 20 years only, for, for instance, since 2000, nearly 1 million kilometers of fiber optic cables have been laid on the seabed. And these cables carry 99% of all international telecommunication. It's faster, cheaper, and more reliable than satellites. Likewise, the annual volume of cargo transported by container shipping has quadrupled over the last 20 years. Today, maritime transport accounts for 80% of global trade by volume, 70% by value. It really is the bloodstream of globalization. Most of the major discoveries of oil and gas deposits have happened offshore in the recent years. And the ocean is also seen as a new frontier for renewable energy. Uh, for instance, offshore wind, um, like offshore wind energy capacity has increased 400 fold since 2000. The first license for deep sea mining, a very controversial activity, was granted in 2001. Since then, an area of ocean floor equivalent to the size of Peru 
has been leased for exploratory deep sea mining. More than 13,000 marine genetic sequences have been registered in patents. A surge in desalination plants has led to 65 million cubic meter of seawater being desalinated every day. So this is the blue acceleration. It is this new reality of the ocean. And it's fairly intuitive to imagine the cumulative pressures that these activities exert on the ocean in parallel with land-based activities and of course the impact of climate change. That was brilliant. Thanks, uh, Jean-Baptiste. Um, really fascinating to sort of hear it sort of spelled out in those really specific terms. And it, it is sort of frightening to think that this is sort of what we've seen in only just the last three decades. Um, I guess it isn't really hard to see how these accelerating pressures are, are changing the ocean. And as I said a bit in the, in the introduction, that we know that the oceans are becoming hotter, more acidic and, and less oxygenated. Um, but Jessica, given your background studying sort of the deep history of the oceans, I'm quite keen to, to hear from you on that point about, you know, are we entering sort of an era that's unprecedented in the ocean or is there something, you know, quite familiar about the sort of changes on a sort of biological and physical um, scale that are currently happening in the, in the world's ocean? Yes, we have seen these type of physical and biological changes in Earth's past. Geology teaches us that some, if not most, of the major mass extinction events that have happened since the dawn of animal life on our planet 600 million years ago are tied to times of high CO2. It's equally ugly twin ocean acidification and low marine oxygen levels that are a consequence of high CO2. So there's actually a cascading effect of greenhouse gas emissions. Now, John Baptiste mentioned that humans are a planetary or geological force. And when we talk about mass extinctions, they're caused in Earth's past by these geological forces. So, for example, by planetary scale volcanism or fissure eruptions, lava intrusions that come from deep within the Earth and erupt over almost a million years, spewing lava and greenhouse gases into the atmosphere um, and cover areas that are, you know, one third the size of the moon or the fallout from a giant asteroid impact that blocks sunlight and results in a cascading effect of um, no photosynthesis of the material that it hits, um, causing heating and cooling on long time scales. So these are planetary scale eruptions. And then we have arriving on the scene 100,000 years ago, the planetary force of Homo sapiens, so us. And in fact, we've just recorded the highest CO2 emissions in the last 4 million years in May. So reaching 419 parts per million. Numbers that we're throwing out, now mass extinctions themselves, they, these, have, these have punctuated the history of life on our planet, resetting the evolutionary clock each time in unpredictable ways, but are responsible for the overall shape of life. And they've been caused in the past by these cascading effects of high CO2. And what were the consequences to life? Well. 50 to 90% of all species on the planet were decimated at these mass extinction events. And these are numbers that I'm throwing out, but if you can imagine if you've been snorkeling recently to take advantage of the nice weather, or if you remember going on, on walks during lockdown, if you were to remember what the ambient um, situation looked like around you, then close your eyes and 50% to nearly everything that you see being wiped out, those are the kind of levels of devastation that are the result of greenhouse gas induced warming and the measurable consequences associated with this at mass extinction events. And we know this from the sedimentary time machines, the rock record, the only tape recorder we have of the vast geological real estate that's on our planet and what the consequences to life were. So when CO2 was higher 56 million years ago, there were crocodiles that approached the North Pole. When CO2 was higher 66 million years ago, there were large expanses of coastal regions that were underwater and nothing bigger than 21 kilograms survived. When CO2 was higher 200 million years ago and 250 million years ago from that widespread um, volcanic events that one of them opening the Atlantic Ocean and ripping apart vast expanses of the earth and throwing up um, greenhouse gases, will those result in asphyxiation of the starvation of life where it's actually decimated because there's no oxygen. And these are events that have played out multiple times in this tape recorder of the past. We know this from um, studying these ancient abrupt climate events and it's that abruptness that makes them more 
um, severe. So these low oxygen conditions, well, they're part of the the issue and they happen by um, the combination of the increased CO2 leading to higher temperatures. That increased CO2 dissolves in the ocean and, um, and, and creates um, a, a free hydrogen gas, which basically attacks or eats away, acidifies shells. And then also the solubility of oxygen um, decreases in a hot ocean. So basically that's the same principle as if you try to enjoy a carbonated beverage on a hot day and you've cracked open the can, you've popped open that lid and notice that it doesn't fizz. That's because hot waters don't um, contain as much gas as cool waters do. And that results in oxygen disappearing. So low oxygen levels, and that's toxic to most life because it needs oxygen in order to respire. So these mass extinction events in deep time, they have profoundly impacted the modern species diversity. Yet paradoxically, species are being lost at such a rate now that these ancient events are providing valuable lessons about the susceptibility of our modern species and environmental controls on species loss. That's great. Thanks, Jessica. Um, I guess that the um, there's a really kind of uh, familiar sort of um, phenomenon you described there, these sort of low oxygen zones. And I think they're more commonly referred to as dead zones, you know, these parts of the ocean where there's just such low oxygen levels that most life really can't, can't exist. Um, Joanne, I just want to come to you on that point. Um, I know that dead zones are kind of a common problem around coastlines today, uh, particularly in places like the Gulf of Mexico, as, as you know it, Jessica, where we have a lot of pollution that ends up in the water that kind of um, creates these massive blooms of algae that ultimately decay and sap oxygen from the water. Um, but I'm also aware that you know nature had ways of keeping these events in check in the past. And I think one of the, the best ways of, of doing this was with oysters, I believe, oyster reefs, which essentially clean the water uh, by filtering all that algae out. Um, could you maybe just tell us a little bit about how differently the uh, coastal seas in Europe used to look when we, we had these, these reefs in place? How differently did the sea behave, I suppose, as well? Yeah, sure, Jack. So I think, you know, one single oyster can filter um, around 200 litres of seawater a day. And, and what they do is they consume the algae, the small phytoplankton in, in the water, and, uh, and this controls sort of algal blooms and, and help control eutrophication. But obviously you remove the oysters, then you're not gonna get that, that bottom up control. Now, um, in 1883, there was a piscatorial atlas, basically a, a fish map produced by a guy called Olsen that showed the extent of oyster reefs um, all around the UK and Northern Europe. And, um, and you realize then that the, there were dense oyster reefs all the way around the UK in many locations in the English Channel and a massive one in the North Sea, um, south of the Dogger Bank off the coast of the Netherlands and Germany. And uh, I've got a few what we call historic, historical ecology quotes. And these are quotes from back um, in historic periods that tell us what things looked like then. And it is, this quote really brings it alive. Um, this is from a report in 1875 um, of the fisheries of Norfolk. and. Um, Someone said, I understand that there is an enormous bed in the North Sea, east of the Silver Pits, in about 27 fathoms deep. It's nearly 80 miles long and 25 miles wild. The trawlers, the trawlers avoid this rough ground, as they call it, as much as possible. But when they do, by accident, get onto it, the oysters are so numerous that they fill up the trawl and nearly bring up the vessel. That just it gives you some imagination about what it would have looked like on the seabed. And then we have a witness report that sort of encapsulates this issue of the sliding baseline, the loss of living memory. And this is a quote in 1932 from an old fisherman in Wales in the UK. And uh, he said that in 1856, he had caught in a morning seven hall, in seven halls, so not many halls, as many 8,000 oysters. And now just a catch of three or 4,000 constitutes a good day's work. And you can see how the, sort of the decline there affects the living memory. Another quote from 1946, um, the famous Forth of Firth, Firth of Forth oysters in the um, now practically extinct in the sea locks of the Scottish West um, coasts um, and scarcely a living oyster shell exists. And another quote from 1887 in Plymouth, um, there used to be um, oyster beds up the Plym in the Catawater Harbour, but there are, however, no beds now. And this is attributed by some to overdredging, but more probably due to the refuse from China clay works pouring down the river and choking the beds. 
And so we had incredible devastation decline by the mid to late 1800s. So we've undergone this process of flattening the seabed and not only removing the oysters, but all those services and the habitat they provide. And hopefully that gave you a bit of a picture what we used to have on our doorstep that is now almost entirely extinct. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Joanne. I mean, that, that really does sort of, you know, that's one fishery in, in one species. Um, just that interaction has sort of really totally transformed the the seascape that we've kind of, um, that we're left with. It's, it's really sort of um, quite sort of scary, really, to think about um, how much we've, we've changed without really, probably even really noticing. Um, I guess that uh, this kind of comes back to your research, Jean Baptiste, because obviously what we are seeing now is this, you know, these massive changes that we're fully aware of that we can really sort of see happening in real time and uh, and happening over a much smaller time frame. So uh, I know you recently published some research uh, looking into the people and organizations who are behind this blue acceleration, as, as you call it. Could you tell us uh, a bit about that, please? Yeah, of course. I mean, if, if you think of the if you think of the blue acceleration as some kind of race to the ocean, a scramble for the seas, then the question is who's winning this race? And of course, who's left behind? And this is research we did with Duke University, with, led by John Virdin uh, at Duke University, um, where we looked at revenues from the ocean economy in eight core ocean-based industries as identified by the OECD. So that includes seafood, offshore wind, shipping, oil and gas, ports, uh, marine equipment, and so on. And what you see is that a small number of corporations headquartered in an even smaller number of countries generate most of the revenues from this industry. Like an example, in the cruise tourism sector, for instance, just 10 companies account for 93% of all revenues of the sector. And this is a pattern you see across the different ocean sectors, right? So now if you aggregate across all industries, the 100 largest corporation in the ocean by revenues, what we called the Ocean 100, they account for 60% of total revenues, the equivalent of 1.1 trillion US dollars. Now, nearly half of this Ocean 100 and nine of the top 10 are oil and gas companies, which is today by far the largest ocean-based industry by value. This in itself illustrates a stark contrast between the aspiration of a truly blue economy and the reality of today's dominant paradigms of extraction from the ocean. My final point here would be that concentration is also in specific parts of the world. So half of all revenues from the Ocean 100 end up in just seven countries, the USA, Saudi Arabia, China, Norway, France, the UK, and South Korea. Saudi Arabia is in this list because of Saudi Aramco, the world's largest oil and gas companies, which has a lot of offshore activities. So it gives you a sense of, of the poorly distributed uh, revenues from uh, the benefits of, of the ocean right now. Thanks, Jean-Baptiste. Um, I guess that that is pretty striking when you consider that um, obviously the, the human relationship with the ocean is fairly ancient. And for much of that time, it existed as a global commons. Um, I, I guess that I, what I'm really kind of keen to sort of get your thoughts on is, you know, now that we've sort of found out about this, you know, the rise of the ocean 100, as, as you talk about it, you know, what are, what are the risks essentially and, and the opportunities for such massive private domination of much of the, the ocean's sort of um, economic activity, in your view? Yeah, well, I mean, one of the main risks, which, which we're observing already, is that benefits disproportionately flow to economically powerful states and corporations, while the harms are largely affecting developing nations and local communities. So it is well known that large corporations can use their power to lobby government against social or environmental rules, stifle innovation, and ultimately threaten access for traditional users, such as small-scale fishers, who often end up being marginalized in political and decision-making process. So effective public policies are needed here to improve regulations and help shift corporate power away from being exercised to the detriment of sustainable and equitable use of the ocean. In the meantime, though, I mean, a few large companies dominating the ocean economy, that also means one knows which doors to knock on in order to fast track conversation about ocean sustainability. You know who to make accountable. So given their size and influence, voluntary sustainability commitments 
by the Ocean 100 could set new industry norms and accelerate transformation towards sustainability. In fact, these 100 companies, they represent the largest corporate beneficiaries of ocean use, which, as you said, Jack, is a global common. So you could argue that they are in a unique position to take responsibility, to exercise global leadership, and to ultimately drive change in their respective industries in the best of the world. And I think scientists have a critical role to play in this process. Like increasingly, corporate leaders now regard sustainability as a key for their business and a chance for companies to add value or to access emerging markets. It's becoming a buzzword, right? And an important one for businesses, not any longer just for NGOs or civil society. The risk, though, is that companies hijack the sustainability agenda and define it in a way that is convenient for their operation and legitimate self-regulations over national or international rules, meaning failing to, to address major social and environmental issues. So I think the role of scientists here, by engaging with business leaders, as we did at the Stockholm Resilience Center within the seafood industry with the CBOS initiative, among other, it is to ensure decision making is based on the best available science with a particular eye on the equity dimension too, not just the environmental side, but also the social one. Great, thanks Jean-Baptiste, that's, that's really great. Um, I think that we've kind of, at this stage we've sort of, we've heard a lot about, you know, our present relationship with the ocean and also how we've we kind of got here. Um, I'm really keen that we can sort of now turn to to the future and, and I suppose in particular the next 10 years, uh, given that we are sort of at the, the, the beginning, the crest of this um, UN decade of the ocean. Um, Joanne, I know that you're leading work to restore oyster reefs um, in European coastal waters. So uh, what I'm really eager to hear is, you know, what, how does someone bring these habitats back to life? You know, what, what does that work look like essentially? What's involved? Mm. Well, I think the first thing I want to say is absolute, absolutely doable. This is this is not rocket science. We have the biological, ecological knowledge and expertise to do this, but we don't have all the frameworks in place to roll it out. Um, so it, this is a relatively new area in the UK and Europe. They've been pioneering this in the States and Australia. And so when we started doing restoration projects here in the UK, it's a massively steep learning curve. And it was really hard to find out the information you needed to know to put restoration in practice. And so as a community, we wrote a how-to guide. So anyone who wants to restore can pick up the guide and it gives you a step-by-step -step guide and everything you need to know to set up a restoration project. But sort of to sum up really, some of this content is that you cannot do it alone. This is, has to be um, a collaborative project involving stakeholders and partners. And that is the first thing you do. Restoration will not be successful without the inclusion of a wide range of knowledge, um, sort of local ecological knowledge as well as scientific and invest in your relationships with stakeholders. Then there's a few technical things you need to do like conduct a feasibility study, um, conduct baseline surveys to see if it's feasible to do it in your location. And then you need to set your restoration goal. Different restoration projects, even of the same species, will have really different goals. So one might be to mitigate water quality and improve um, nitrate levels. Another one might be to improve biodiversity. Another oyster restoration project may be to provide overspill for fisheries and have a sustainable um, um, resource management plan in the area. But fundamentally, there's two main approaches. Either um, you have some oysters, but there's not enough of the, the right substrate, the night, enough, not enough of the right shell for the larvae to settle in. And that's what we call a substrate limited system. So then you need to put oyster shell back into the right sediments. So the larvae that swim in the water will settle and start creating that oyster habitat. And that might involve a shell recycling scheme or a, as part of your project. All this requires licensing and permitting, which can take months, if not years, to get in place. That's a big part of the project as well. In other areas, you just need more oysters. They're extinct or they're just in such low numbers or they've had a massive genetic population bottleneck. And that's what we call recruitment, recruitment limited. So there's no larvae going into the system from adult oysters on the seabed. Now, this is a fun bit. Trying to source oysters of a highly um, sort of, you know, highly endangered or critically endangered habitat. So um, you can sometimes take them from areas that are fished and put them into protected areas. Um, I put in protected zones so you then start to kickstart a natural reef. Um, you can produce them in a restoration hatchery. That's what we're doing here at the Institute of Marine Sciences. 
or you can buy from commercial suppliers. Um, there's lots of things to consider around genetics and biosecurity, but I'm not going to go into those details about that now. Um, but fundamentally, what you want to do is restore a self-sustaining population. Some of the things we've done is take oysters um, out of fisheries, um, so they would, would have been going to the plate, and put them into cages and baskets off marinas around the country so they breed more readily and just pump out larvae that go and colonize the seabed. But what we're really doing at the moment is scaling up into seabed deployment. So this is getting oysters, uh, that are the right oysters for the right location and restoring the seabed by putting you know, several hundred thousand, if not million, back onto the, the seabed. Um, and then lastly, this is no good unless you know it's been a success. So you need to monitor your project. So that's measuring things like the growth, mortality, all the ecosystem services they provide, like changes in water quality or turbidity. So in a nutshell, that's how you do oyster restoration. So it's a, it's a great thing to do, and it's a great thing to do as a communi community involving all the stakeholders that are interested. Thanks, Joanne. That, that sounds really wonderful. And just very quickly, could you tell us how much you, you've actually managed to restore already and, and what you're kind of aiming to, to have restored by the end of the, of the next decade? Yeah, sure. So since 2015, there's gone from 0 to 11 projects in the UK. Um, and uh, now Europe has 18 projects across 10 countries. We're still at the piloting and trialing stage. We've just finished that stage in Europe. And now we want large scale seabed restoration. Um, and that's what we're going to be doing over this summer. For example, in the Solent, we're going to be putting 20, 200,000 oysters into the seabed to sort of kickstart a, a natural sort of reimagine re what the oyster reef might have been before it was taken out by humans. Um, so far from the oyster oysters in cages, we talked about the oyster nurseries, we know that we've probably produced around 18 billion larvae that's been pumped out into the systems. But what we really want to do is see restoration at scale, you know, so large self-sustaining populations of oysters being, being re-established in the coastal systems and providing all those ecosystem services we need of this restored habitat. Um, we need an interconnected approach. I want to see, you know, restoration alongside blue carbon habitats. So it enables there an improvement of the environment for the restoration of sea grasses and other things like that. Um, we need to stop dredging the seabed. We need to stop flattening and doing destructive extraction techniques because we don't need to do that. And, and that will only happen if we don't see restoration as a luxury. You know, it is a necessity if we want to thrive as humans and we need it to mitigate both the climate and the biodiversity crisis, in, in my opinion. Thank you, Joanne. That's a, a really good point. I think uh, I'd like to come to you on that, Jessica, because, of course, the um, the the ocean isn't just uh, a, you know, it, it isn't just a sort of an opportunity to um, restore ecosystems that could mop up some of the you know, the particular challenges like um, low oxygen zones and stuff like that. It's also, we're talking on very, a very grand scale that, you know, we could harness the ocean to sort of remediate some of the damage that we've already done. And could you talk a little bit just about the, the sort of, perhaps, you know, a couple of the, the, the major ways in which your experience has kind of prepared you to, to, um, to consider that question? Sure, absolutely. So the oceans are a very useful ally and there are global engineering solutions that we can certainly push forward on, but that doesn't mean that it's a get out of jail free card. As global citizens, as members of humanity, we simply must decrease CO2 outputs and nutrient overloading in coastal regions. So we need to minimize these offenses and let the oceans recover. The oceans are resilient. We know this from the 4.3 billion year record of them on Earth, but history teaches us that, but we need to give them a chance. We need to acknowledge our damaging role. Um, and at the same time, there are investments in concepts of geomimicry and biomimicry, so global engineering that are essential. And these take their names from evolution in the sense of life in our planet. So just like the origins of flight and the um, and the shielding on a space shuttle come from reptilian skin. Um, there are ideas in terms of how the the Earth itself has had these very high levels of CO2. It's been a dynamic planet and how they naturally have resolved themselves. So here we're exploiting or we're capitalizing on the benefit of the millions and even billions of years 
of trial and error that the earth and evolution have had to perfect designs in nature. And it's logical then that human construction can benefit from drawing from the influence of geology and biology. So there are two ways to do this when we're talking about carbon dioxide, and that's considering the way that the Earth's carbon cycle works in general, which is on the short term with the biological pump and on the long term by actually making rocks. So on shorter time scales over the last two million years, the most dynamic changes have been those related to giant glaciers that began to cover large portions of the planet and waxed and waned. And they're tied to changes in carbon dioxide varying from 180 to 300 parts per million. Now remember in contrast, we just put, hit 419 parts per million in May and Earth's past tied to these mass extinction events that were values at about 1000 PPM. So for the short term, for the biological pump, this is something that would, um, would be global engineering on, on a long scale that that comes into play when we think about, well, what was really controlling the ice ages? And there's a great quote from a, a great and wild maverick who put this out there, John Mar Martin, who said, give me half a tank of iron and I'll give you the next ice age. Meaning that if you seed the top layers of the ocean with iron, which is something that happened from continental runoff and dust going into the oceans in between glacial intervals that allows for microscopic marine organisms, things like diatoms to multiply dramatically. And then they photosynthesize on a great scale, scale absorbing that di carbon dioxide dissolved in the water, which in turn draws the gas out of the air. And if this is done on a large enough scale, then iron fertilization might strip enough CO2 and cool Earth's climate. Now, um, that might work on a shorter time scale. There are some nuances, of course, with anything that that makes um, changes in that way. In fact, there are, uh, you know, there are always pluses and minuses. And another way to do this is to speed up the long term carbon cycle, the silicate weathering system where you're actually making rocks quicker. These are all part of the same system. So they can be thought of in the same way that nesting dolls or Russian dolls are all stacked. There's all pieces of the same um, thing, they're just nestled within each other. So on the longer term, car the carbon cycle makes rocks on geological timescales. And um, the idea would be to speed up that process so that excess CO2 is captured and actually stored in rocks and forms things like limestone. So the same thing that coral reefs are made of or a piece of chalk. And to do that would basically be to pump that um, CO2 into areas where there hasn't been interaction with um, with um, the atmosphere yet, and then use microbes to speed up the reactions in order to store carbon dioxide, because in the silicate weathering system, for every one mole of CO2 that's in the atmosphere, two moles of CO2 are stored in the rock itself, thereby sequestering and storing that carbon. Great, thank you, Jessica. Um, I think that we, we have a little bit of time left, and I just wanna kind of pivot from the, the scientific um, to the, the political and economic. And I know Jean-Baptiste, you're kind of keeping a close eye on, on the sort of political opportunities that exist in the next decade um, to sort of reform how nations and industries operate in the ocean. Do you want to kind of just give us a rundown of some of the key sort of flashpoints in that that people can sort of um, uh, look out for? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and especially because I, I always get nervous when I, I hear geoengineering and, and this, this idea of putting iron, iron in the ocean at large scale, and it's it's quite unsettling. And so I think it's it's certainly part of, of a solution probably to some extent. Uh, but I think one political opportunity is in, in the coming decade and, and decades even is decarbonizing our society, right? And phasing out fossil fuels. And, and there are more and more countries actually making plans and setting ambitious targets to try to stop emitting uh, as much CO2 in the, in the atmosphere. At the end of the day, I mean, it's not only the UN decade of ocean science that starts this year, it's also the UN decade of action, uh, of action to deliver on, on the 17 sustainable development goals. And I think scaling up and scaling up and, and accelerating uh, a shift towards a sustainable ocean will require a collective and collaborative effort across entire value chain. So that takes policymakers and regulatory bodies, but also businesses, civil society, the scientific community, and the financial industry as well to create the right incentives, right? An example of, of some of one of that is after more than two decades of negotiation, 
the World Trade Organization is really close to strike a deal to eliminate government subsidies, public finance for IUU fishing. IUU stands for illegal, unregulated and unreported fishing. And the idea is that right now, 35 billion annually are of public finance is going and fueling uh, overfishing. More than 64% of those subsidies are considered capacity enhancing, in other words, harmful. And less than 30% are considered beneficial, right? So the, the point of the deal is to try to, to eliminate those harmful subsidies and also prohibit a certain form of subsidies that contribute to overcapacity and to overfishing. Likewise, another set of negotiations that have been underway since 2005, it is this time for an international legally binding instrument under United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea on the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction. It is a mouthful, uh, but it's a really important one. In, in, in essence, it is to try to guarantee the, the conservation of marine biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Because there is something very unique with the ocean is that two thirds of it lies beyond national jurisdiction, right? So it, it's not the property, it's not the sovereign right of any country. It's called the international water, the high seas and the international area, like the area that's the part of the seabed that lies beyond that jurisdiction. And it's, it's really hard to govern because it's, it, all countries are involved. It is the shared inheritance of humanity in a way. On the finance side, another example would be the EU taxonomy, which is the flagship, um, one of the pillars of the European Green Deal, but building back better after the, um, after the COVID crisis, among other. And, and that is a classification system that establishes a list of environmentally sustainable economic activities. So this is perhaps one of the most ambitious recent development in finance to redirect investments towards more sustainable practices by defining what can be considered a sustainable activity and how to finance it. So overall, I think the last few months have seen ambitious pledges by nations and by corporations in some cases to safeguard the ocean. Every week, almost, you hear about a new commitment. And what will make the difference is whether those nations and those corporations do listen to the science, ultimately, and actually turn words into action. And I think th this is the challenge ahead of us. Thank you, Jean-Baptiste. That was, that was great. Um, thank you, all of our panelists. I think uh, we've got a lot of questions from the audience, so I just want to make sure that we can kind of fit in as many as possible. Um, the first one, I think this is probably most appropriate for jo uh, Joanne. This is uh, a question from Josephine, uh, who asks, um, can eating oysters ever be sustainable? Um, because apparently jo Josephine's meeting more and more people who are otherwise vegan, but eat farmed oysters because uh, they're supposed to be good for the environment. What, what's your take on that, Joanne? Um, yes, I think there's a sort of a, a big pu publicity from some chefs saying that oysters are vegan, pretty much. Um, but um, it is an incredibly sustainable protein source and food source. Um, and so it can be reared in a really sort of restorative um, process through aquaculture. Um, it can also, as well as being produced for food, it can also serve as bioremediation um, for other, other fisheries around it. So I would say it's possibly one of the most sustainable protein sources you can get. Um, and it has a really, really low carbon footprint. It's like the, the, it's the lowest carbon footprint of all the, sort of the meats, really. And so in that sense, it's very sustainable. Um, and, and, and so I think I could understand why if you, for environmental reasons, were a vegan, you would then sort of maybe then include your, your, your circle a bit wider to include oysters as well. So, yeah, it has the potential to be incredibly so. But the extraction process isn't always sustainable. Thank you, Joanne. Um, I think Jean Baptiste, you might have uh, touched on some of these in your in your um, your earlier answer, but um, we have a question from Nicholas uh, specifically about uh, the treaty on areas beyond national jurisdictions. And Nicholas asks, "What do you see as the main barriers to securing an agreement on that?" Well, there certainly are many because they've been negotiated for more than 50 years now, 15 years. Uh, one of the big barriers is that the way it was written uh, originally, like the way the negotiations were initiated, meant that it should not undermine, whatever the agreement would be, could not undermine existing regulatory bodies. 
And that is a problem because if you look at the ocean today, it is a patchwork of governance framework, right? Governing fishing in some areas with the regional fishing um, uh, RFMOs, regional fishery management organizations, sorry, uh, different like covering the ocean, but you also have managing of the, of the deep sea with the International Seabed Authority, you, with the ISA, you have the IMO, the International Maritime Organization for the shipping. So all those bodies, and most of them are under the United Nations, already exist. And whatever is agreed for this area beyond national jurisdiction is not supposed to undermine this, which, which means it's going to be really difficult to find a consensus on how we can move forward and how we can have all the countries, including the global north and the global south, and some countries that depend much more on some resources for their future economic growth than others to actually agree on, on either not extracting those resources despite the fact that they need it while others have before. It's always the same story. So at the end of the day, it's, it's 150 plus countries negotiating that. So this in itself is quite a barrier. I see, yeah. Thanks, Jean-Baptiste. Um, I've just got an, a question here from Ella as well. And I think this is uh, for Jessica. Um, you talked a little bit about the mass extinction events that we saw in the, the uh, the Earth's, uh, in the ocean's history. Um, what is your understanding of the kinds of life that tend to persevere in these situations? You know, what tends to sort of get through, I guess? Well, that's a great question. And um, when we think about all the species that have existed on our planet, 99.99% have gone extinct. And they basically have gone extinct in those five cataclysmic episodes of big mass extinction events. All to say that what we're doing to our planet isn't going to kill it, it's going to make it look very different. And when we think about what that landscape then looks like, there, it's actually very difficult to predict because life is surprising and it's tenacious, but who actually wins the extinction lottery is very difficult to predict, especially at high trophic levels, the top of the food chain. When we talk about microbial life, um, it's a little bit easier, but basically what proliferates through a mass extinction event are disaster taxa, pioneer taxa. They're things that tend to reproduce quickly and are great colonizers. They have some general features that are selected for depending on the nuances of the cascading environmental effects. But just to give you an example, 400 million years ago, the seas were dominated by a double-decker bus-sized shark-eating fish. These were placoderms, they were apex predators, they had guillotines for teeth um, and they had a front end that was built like a bulldozer. Then the events happen, global change happened, they go extinct. They're basically asphyxiated because of low oxygen conditions spreading. And what rises in their place is a story of the meek shall inherit the earth, which is another typical um, thing that happens in the aftermath of mass extinctions. What rises are bony fish. So that's the type that make up your dinner plate. Those flourish. Again, it's a story of the small things get through, the things that you wouldn't anticipate getting through, and then they proliferate and expand widely. It's the same story about whales in the wake of the Cretaceous mass extinction that killed giant reptiles like plesiosaurs and mosasaurs, and also the non-flying dinosaurs. So that's for the big, the big picture organisms. It's also how we as mammals got through. It's that same extinction event hedgehog size mammals get through, there's a fundamental reptile mammal transition. So life is tenacious, it's surprising, it's unpredictable. In terms of what actually sustains during in those interval, in those um, regions of the oceans that have low oxygen conditions, that's a microbial story. So there's a whole suite of microbes that thrive in those kind of conditions and feed back to these blooms these, and, and then lead to even more cascading effects. So microbial life, those naked to the visible um, eye, organisms that drive by geochemical cycles on our planet, they do really well in those so-called dead zones. Um, they do well and they bloom and then algae build on those. So that's what, what happens at these mass extinction events. Thanks, Jessica, that, that's really fascinating. And, and sticking with you, actually, I think that um, we've got one question from, from Mikey. Who, um, who was just curious to know more about the sort of, you mentioned that there were a lot of nuances around this idea of iron fertilization. Could you sort of sketch out just, just briefly some of the main sort of concerns that scientists and others have about using a concept like that to help sort of cool the earth? Exactly. So um, this is tough when we start talking about wide scale global engineering, because again, just like with the mass extinction events, 
the after the actual effects are not quite predictable. So when we start thinking about CO2 storage in the oceans, an ocean fertilization strategy is actually a temporary solution. It itself leads to ocean acidification, changing chemistry, changing ecologies like the proliferation of these bacteria that I'm talking about, which have a feedback where then when you have proliferation of bacteria and algae, you kind of run through the whole scenario again. So the oceans absorb heat and they absorb carbon dioxide. That's true. They're a great ally in that sense. We heard that they absorb about 50% of CO2 that goes into the atmosphere, but it's not without consequences as an additional oxygen loss, further deoxygenation and acidification. So there's a big trade-off. Mm, thanks, Jessica. Um, so yeah, it very much sounds like these are pretty difficult decisions that can't be sort of um, reliably sort of predicted in advance, I guess, is the main takeaway. Um, one thing that we've got, uh, another like a recurring question we've seen in the comments is, um, is about marine protection. And uh, there's a question here about the idea of national marine parks uh, from Fiona. To what extent, and I guess maybe Jean Baptiste, this might be appropriate too. Although I'm quite keen for anyone to sort of jump in as well, because it does kind of refer to to all of your research. What extent do you think the sort of concept of national marine parks, as it's currently constituted, will be useful in the next ten years for um, for helping turn around some of the major problems we have in the world's ocean? Well, thanks, Jack. But I'm I'm going to open the floor for Joanne maybe because maybe she has a more grounded uh, reflection on that in in the oyster case. I, I can speak globally about the the MPAs and the thirty by thirty agenda, but maybe like let's ground it into what was discussed on the oyster first. Yeah, sure. So I mean, an MPA could be a name, could be a paper park. A lot of them aren't effective. What's important is what you are what you are protecting. So if you're protecting a degraded system it's not going to provide us with the services we need. So what I think we need to do is have a, a bigger ambition. If we understand what we've lost, particularly in the coastal areas, all the mangroves, all the coral reefs, all the seagrasses, all the salt marshes, all the oyster reefs, if you understand what we've lost, then we'll be more ambitious about what we will restore. And when we restore these ecosystems at scale, we restore the services, the carbon drawdown, the biodiversity, the coastal protection, the sedimentation, the water quality, all these things you restore with it. So. I think it's a great first ambition. If that 30% included actually protected areas that did not have any destructive extraction of resources that stuck to um, you know, sustainable aquaculture or sustainable approaches, that's a non-linear in its approach, it doesn't assume that there's an inexhaustible supply of resources from the ocean, then they're great. But many MPAs, you can still fish in. I mean, it is quite... So we have to really grapple with what an MPA, MPA is and when it becomes effective. And that needs to go alongside restoring degraded systems and then protecting them also. So I think we need to be more ambitious than we are now. And we certainly need to try and put back the ecosystems on which humans depend. If we want to thrive as humans, we need a thriving coastal ecosystem as well. Thanks very much, John. John Baptiste, did you want to add anything to that? No, I, I think that was perfect. I think this is like she she really hits one of the key points, which is the enforcement and the monitoring and the enforcement of an MPA. Right? It's just just not enough to draw a line on a map and say, "Oh, that's it. That's an MPA." As you said, you say some MPA have fishing involved. On the other hand, some MPA you cannot fish, but you're gonna go and drill for oil, or you're allowed to do seabed mining. Right? So you have this mismatch between the aspiration of an MPA. And it's enforcement. So I think this this would be referred to as paper park, where you don't have any kind of, of monitoring nor enforcement. So the, the key is really in the enforcement. And then if it's enforced, all indication shows that it is very efficient. And you even have what is called the spillover effect, which is by protecting really and enforcing protection on a specific area, it's going to benefit the adjacent areas as well, which is non-negligible in the case of fishing, for instance, for the for the industry. Thanks, John Baptiste. That was brilliant. So we only have about a minute left, but I am really keen to squeeze in one last question. And this uh, is for each of you. So if you can try and answer this in maybe 30 seconds or less. Um, if there was one thing that you could hope to see change in our relationship with the ocean by 2030, what would it be? For me, it'd be to stop destructive fishing practices and create restorative processes that are circular and work within planetary boundaries that we know we need to survive. 
Great, thank you, Joanne, very succinct. Um, Jessica, or whoever wants to hop, jump in. Well, I think it's time we turn off the taps in terms of the causes of habitat destruction that leads to mass extinction. So it's not just CO2 warming and melting ice sheets, it's acidification, expansion of dead zones, measurable consequences of those increased CO2. So I hope we'll dramatically reduce CO2 emissions, which will benefit the oceans. But then I also hope that we will reduce release of urban waste. So nutrients, fertilizers, sewage going into coastal waters. We need to address the problems in those coastal waters and that requires local action on the scale of fertilizer use on large scales. So places like the Gulf of Mexico, where we alluded to the dead zones expanding, that's because of the relationship to the Mississippi runoff um, from the American heartland. So these are fixable problems, but we need to act now. Thanks, Jessica. Very, very quickly, Jean-Baptiste. <laughs> very quickly, then I'll go back to how I ended up. The, the final question you asked me, which is for nations and cooperation to really turn words into action and beyond that, turn action into results, right? Like six months ago in December, the Norwegian government committed to 100% sustainable ocean management by 2025, which was really welcome and bold commitment. And just weeks later, the same government announced 61 new licenses for offshore oil and gas exploration, and it's planned to permit seabed mining as early as 2023. So there is a mismatch here between the sustainable rhetoric that everyone welcomes and that is much needed, but the reality of ongoing policies. Uh, and getting rid of that blue washing, I think, is, is what I look forward for the UN decade. Perfect. Thank you all so much. I think that's all we've got time for. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed this webinar today, brought to you by The Conversation. And a massive thank you to our panelists for their time and giving us these fascinating insights into this very important topic. So thank you, Jean-Baptiste Jouffre, Joanne Prest Preston, and Jessica Whiteside. And thanks to all our viewers uh, for joining us and for your excellent questions. Um, until next time, thank you and goodbye.